We are now recording. Good evening. Who knows Romans 12, 1 and 2? Heath, come on down. I only get 26 more minutes. You gotta. I'm serious. Come on. Let's hear it. Whatever translation your heart memorized. Well, it might be half of one and half the other. <laughs> and so, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Uh, what? Don't shush. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being put on the spot. You can do it. All he has done for you. Um, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. Mm-hmm. This, for this truly is the way to worship him. Don't be. See, this is where I know a different. Don't again. copy. Don't copy. See, be be not transformed. Yeah, be, be not conformed. We just switched translation. That's okay. Keep going. Keep going. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For this is the way that you will prove God's perfect and pleasing and acceptable. Amen. Amen. Had about four translations at work there, but they're all from the Bible, so. <laughs> yes. That was one of those parallel Bibles. Oh, that was NLT that she had. Yeah. That says right on there, doesn't it? Yeah, so if you're working on memorization, NLT might not always be the easiest one. They put more of words. Okay, okay. Josiah has the floor. Here we go. <clears throat> him. All right. One thing that has really blessed my heart in the last, just the last few weeks, um, even the last couple of months, is God is working in the hearts of the leadership of this church. Amen. There is a vibrant spiritual life in the top leadership and the core leadership of this church. Vibrant. It's life-giving. It's full of joy. Uh, it's not been an easy season. We've been working real hard. Uh, but there is a unity, there is a vibrancy of that spiritual life, and now we have 50 people gathered in a room that are attentive to that same vibrancy and that plugging into that spiritual life, and that is how revival starts. So hold on to your seats, folks, because we are on the revival train, and here we go. Amen. So you are here tonight, you matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't realize that you matter. I'm here to tell you tonight, you matter. Turn to your neighbor and say, you matter. You matter. It also matters that you are here tonight. It matters that you are here tonight. It does. What God is doing in your life is significant. He is doing significant things in your life. You matter, and he wants to do more in your life. That more that he wants to do is that beautiful word transform. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, we get this Greek word, metamorpho It's like got two oo's at the end. metamorpho Go ahead and say it. It's fun. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> metamorpho it's the, it's the metamorphosis. You think of like a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's what God is doing in your life, and that's what he can do in any life that surrenders to him. No matter what, no matter where that life comes from, no matter how deep in a pit that little caterpillar was, God can turn that little caterpillar into a butterfly. Yeah. It's beautiful. So on Sunday, Pastor Ray preached a message. It was titled, The Harp and the Spear. It was a great message. It's a great uh, word picture for us to hold on to because it challenges us to think, what am I holding on to? Am I holding on to the harp or am I holding on to the spear? And that's talking about how we are approaching these things that really challenge our souls. How are our souls putting principles into action? As another quote from Sunday, it's very important what we believe because we need to become what we believe. We become what we believe. I need three volunteers. Three volunteers. Come on down. Any three volunteers. You're going to stand in front. You don't have to say things. Come on down. I got one, two, three. Oh, it's a race. Okay. I'm going to have you stand one, two, three. And then I want you to face that direction, okay? I didn't know you were going to get the profile. (laughs) (laughs) Dan talked about this, I believe it was two weeks ago when Pastor Dan preached. And maybe Pastor Rig. I'm kind of confuzzled on it. But we have three parts to us as beings. 
We have the body, which is Danielle, the soul, which is Jen, and the spirit, which is Dan. And right now, the body, soul, and the spirit are all pointing at damnation and hell. No offense, guys. (laughs) The darkness down the hallway is what I'm going with. Okay, sorry, that was purely for humor at your expense. I'm sorry. When we are saved, the spirit is quickened unto salvation. It comes alive. Turn around. Face that way. The spirit is alive. Okay? In that process, in order to get Dan to turn around, the soul has to awaken to its deprived state. Right. So the soul has awakened to its deprived state. It has made a good confession. Jesus is Lord. and has con- So it's admitted its sin. It's believed in Jesus. And here we go. We're saved. All right? Now the soul here the body doesn't do much thinking and if you let the body do the thinking no offense if you let your body do all your thinking you're going to have a very messy life you're going to follow impulses all over the place again not a reflection of the persons who volunteered totally random Good. But but yes, so what we're talking about and, and what Pastor Rag has been talking about and where this church is headed is is getting the people whose spirits are saved to have souls that turn around okay. that align with the spirit. Amen. All right? The body is just like a tent. It's a tent. It does it's it's got impulses, it's got some blood in it, it has some nerves, some tissues. When you die, the body goes away and the rest goes on, okay? And so what we are doing as believers is getting this soul convinced to stay pointed that way. Okay? Not that way. But that way. Okay, thank you. That was the first analogy. That's gonna stick with you, I hope. Thank you for the humility. No offense, Danielle, but when we get to heaven, we get a totally new body. So you're just, you're never part of this picture. I'm sorry. Although the Bible does call you a temple while you're here. So you just got to keep that in mind. So take care of your temples, people. This is not permission to just ruin your bodies. Okay. So tonight what we're talking about in this leadership track is we are getting to this, this topic we're in a camp on for three weeks on discipline. Ooh, everyone's favorite word. Discipline. Spiritual discipline. Yes. So we are getting to spiritual discipline. Now, as a person in general, I understand things by first backing up to the most basic question and defining what those words mean. That's how I study. So my first question is, what is discipline? I literally Googled the word discipline. Define colon discipline. We have training to act in accordance with rules, drills, the training effect of experience, or as Pastor Dan would say, pain is a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm. Discipline can also mean to bring to a state of order and obedience by training and control. Disciplines have certain elements to them. We have drills, training, and specific repeated exercises. There's reproof and rebuke, which is an expression of sharp disapproval or criticism. We have the exercises, an activity that demands vigorous effort. Or we have admonishment, admonishing, to warn sternly or to advise earnestly. I appreciate it when our spiritual leaders have the spiritual sensitivity to admonish the church. We grow by admonishment, by that advising us earnestly. I hope to admonish you tonight, not to criticize, but to admonish. So when we look at the spiritual disciplines, we're talking about disciplines that are bearing spiritual fruit. Okay, we're not just talking about being disciplined. As Paul was talking to Timothy, I think it was Timothy, physical training has some benefit, earthly training. But spiritual training has an eternal benefit. And that's what we're going for tonight is that eternal benefit. This is some of the fruits of spiritual discipline. We can be approved by God for good works. Approved by God for good works. In every house, there are utensils for meaningful, honorable purposes. And there are utensils for... Things you don't talk about. Okay, so in a, in a Jewish house 2,000 years ago, there was the silver platter that you served feast on, and then there was, you know, the poop bucket. Okay, so in God's house, there are, there are very basic wooden structures that do the dirty work, but then there are honorable things. And what spiritual disciplines can help us do is get to a place where we are approved for honorable purposes to be used by God. Another fruit of spiritual discipline is that we are blessed. We're happy. Yeah. That's good. I like being happy. 
We are shown the way of life, not the way of death. We are shown the way of life. We have wisdom. We have knowledge that we can apply to our lives. And then we have this peaceful fruit of righteousness, being in right standing with God. Have you ever been in wrong standing with somebody? Has there been peace in that circumstance with that person when you were in wrong standing? Neither is there peace with God when we are in wrong standing with God. So in the next three weeks here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a few different perspectives on spiritual disciplines. And this week, I'm going to dig into the inward disciplines. The inward disciplines. Inward disciplines are things that involve you and Jesus. You and Jesus things. It's exactly what Pastor Ray preached about on Sunday. I got really excited as you got through your message on Sunday because he talked about soul work, and that's what we're talking about right here. The goal of our inward disciplines, we want to connect our head and our heart to the mind and the heart of God. Yeah. Our head and our heart are both soulish things, and we want to connect those to the Spirit of God. If you go back to our three amigos analogy here, yeah. They are bringing that soul and that body into alignment with the spirit. Amen. What, it, it, it's not just a one-way conduit, too, though. It's a, it's a two-way conduit. What we can then do is bring spiritual realities yeah. into our present reality. Yeah. And that's goodness. That's good right there. Some of you need a little more spiritual reality in the circumstances that you are facing. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. It restores the image of God in our lives. Spiritual disciplines can do that. It puts our beliefs into action. That's what spiritual disciplines can do for us, and that's why we're talking about it when we talk about leadership. I do want to mention that there's always two underlying themes of all the disciplines. The first one is joy. Joy. I said it. I said the word discipline and joy in the same sentence. Wow. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence there is fullness of joy. That's the God we serve. And the disciplines connect us with God. We're not just trying to be more disciplined people. That's not the goal. The goal of the next three weeks is not to raise up an army of, of doers of regiment. It is to pursue God. Taking what he's given us, a soul and a body, pointing it towards him so that he can do his work in us. So that first thing, joy, 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 joy. Everyone say joy. joy. If you are not experiencing joy in the next three weeks, you're doing it wrong. Okay? Something is wrong. Talk to Jesus about it. He'll help you sort it out. But if you're not experiencing joy in your spiritual disciplines, then you're doing it wrong. The next thing we experience with these spiritual disciplines, and it's a theme of the Christian life, is freedom. Amen. It's about freedom. <laughs> Let those chuckle who picked that up. Okay. Is there anyone in this room who has experienced any sort of freedom in Christ? Mm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Back to our three amigos. At the fall of man, way back in Genesis 2 and 3, when Adam sinned, there were two things that happened. First, that fall was preceded by a lie. Yep. Right. And that lie was elevating self above God. Right. The lie was, surely you will not die. Just, God just doesn't want you to become like him. That was the lie. Second, the fall was followed by fear. We were afraid when we heard you, so we hid. The lie and the fear. You can read it in Genesis 3. Because when God made mankind, he made mankind in his image. Amen. Amen. The three amigos all point in that way. At the fall, the image was tarnished by lie and fear. Yeah. And these are two of the main things that keep people bound up and captive to specifically the patterns of this world. Right. Right. Lies and fears. A Christian life is not a life of lies and fears. Right. It's a life of power, love, and a sound mind or self-control, depending on, again, your translation. Amen. 
Amen. Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For the Spirit of God does not give, make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What a great word. There it is. God wants to work in your life. And you'll know it's Him because your joy will be full and you will no longer be a slave to fear. Right. I'm a child of God. Amen. All right, that brings us to our key verse for this week. I have you guys memorizing this one. This is a passage from Hebrews. It, again, is a longer passage, but I believe in you. Hmm. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I'm reading out of the NIV. This is our passage to memorize for this week. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, which would be like the group around you right now feels like a pretty good cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. That was NIV, if you happen to like that one. It's a pretty good flavor. This is a good verse to dig into. Memorize it, study it, chew on it, talk about it. Yep. I'm going to draw out a phrase here within that first verse. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Pulling back to Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you, metamorpho, ooh, into a new person by changing the way you think. Yeah. When I think about everything that hinders, my mind is drawn to the customs of this world. Sure. Yes. You got to remember, the world is operating on two principles, lie and fear. Right. Lies and fear. Yep. Here's some examples of patterns of this world that can get into our souls, saved or not, and hinder our progress. The first one is materialism. Yep. Yeah. Not just the shallow context of consumerism and this idea of I gotta have more stuff. Materialism is the philosophy that believes that only the only reality is that which is made up by the matter that we see. Yeah. Things we can grab and touch. It's a stark contrast to a belief in a supernatural and a living God who loved us enough to send his son. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. You cannot hold on to the philosophy of materialism right. and develop spiritually. Mm -hmm. Does not compute. Humanism, number two. Humanism. This philosophy seeks the good of mankind with the means of mankind. Right. Therein lies the rub. Right. This philosophy is stuck on the rational approach. Where's my strategic thinkers in the house? Woo -woo. How many of you know <laughs> unconditional love? Sending your son to die for mankind. Not very rational. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. If we're stuck with the humanism, solving it with the means of mankind, we would not be saved. Right. The third one I want to bring up, patterns of this world, agnosticism, agnosticism, A-G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. This is a philosophy that states that nothing can be truly known. As Pastor Ray challenged us a number of weeks ago, we put more faith in our unbelief than we do in our belief. Right. We put more faith in not knowing for sure what we can know right. than we do in the God who proved himself faithful right. to us. Right. Right. There is a God. He is real. Mm -hmm. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die right. for your sins. Yep. You can know that, and you can know God. Yes. Now, when I use these fancy words, like the things with the isms, 
It's pretty easy to feel like that doesn't apply to us. What if I say holding on to things of this world so tightly that you can't get a hold of what God has for you? Holding on to the things of this world so tightly that you can't get a hold of what God has for you. You might think you're off the hook when I say humanism. What if I say relying on your own strength and lacking a daily reliance on God? I'm admonishing right now. You signed up for this. <laughs> I gave you a warning. It's easy to think you're scot-free when I say agnosticism. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Those who, yeah, yeah. But when I, how about when I say that, like Pastor Reg is challenging us with, you're either for Jesus or you're against him. You're either in the light or you're in the dark. There's no twilight. Right? These are things that hinder us. They might not look like sin. We're going to talk about sin in a minute, so that's not off the hook. But they are just as debilitating when it comes to running the race with perseverance. If you do not deal with the hindrances, they will weigh you down. The goal of the disciplines? Throw off the hindrances. Throw off the weights. Let go of the patterns of this world and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Amen. 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 Hindrances are the unbelief systems. The unbelief systems that come from the patterns of this world. Hebrews 12.1 also mentions that sin that so easily entangles. Now, Paul gives us a pretty good list of entangling sins in Galatians 5.19. Talking about walking with the Spirit and what it looks like to walk according to the flesh versus walking according to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And verse 19 through 21 says that the acts of the flesh are obvious. That's what happens when we let the person on the right up here, the third amigo, govern how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft. Now at this point, most of us in the room probably think we're okay. Well, let's go on. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I need another volunteer. <laughs> or Danielle can redeem herself. <laughs> I got to set this one up a little bit. <laughs> now, Danielle has made a commitment to Christ. You can face them if you want. Actually, you can face that way because that'll symbolize that you've made a commitment to Christ. But she has, I got to use good form for this. <laughs> she has taken on some hindrances. Go ahead and put on this ridiculously heavy backpack. Okay. This is my work backpack. It has a five pound MacBook Pro, a three pound textbook, a Bible, and a couple notebooks, and a hard drive, and a flash drive, and a water bottle. Okay. It is. You are hindered. Your perseverance is compromised. Okay? Now we're also going to get really fun and we're going to wrap around some entangling sins. <laughs> Remember, Danielle is saved. Danielle is on her way to heaven and she's running in this race already. She has crossed the starting line. But she's got a little bit of a problem with jealousy. Remember, this is all metaphor. <laughs> this is all metaphor, okay? Don't. Danielle's a great person. <laughs> and then she's got a little bit of a problem with her temper. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's a little prophetic right now. <laughs> and sometimes she just needs to trust God a little bit more, and she doubts. But here we are. Okay. Now, Danielle. Do you think, in your current state, that you will be able to run a race with endurance? Uh, that's a little questionable. Do you want to try running? No. Okay. So, <laughs> you guys are going to have to go there metaphorically and not actually allow her to become injured. This is, this is what 95% of Christians are currently like. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah, it's true. 
Yeah. Mm. That's true. Let's just call it safe and say everybody in this room has something that they can either throw off or detangle. Everybody. Even Pastor Reg has things that he could. God bless him. I honor him more than all of you. But, but he has things that are hindering him that he has to. The devil's got a huge target on his back. And so it is even more important the higher up you go in responsibility, the farther you can fall, right? right. There's a more of a response. You can go ahead and take that off. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's not actually tied. I'm concerned about this. <laughs> there you go. I made it loose. Thank you. But, but seriously, so many. <laughs> Freedom. Hallelujah. Glory. If we do not address the hindrances... If we do not address the sin that is entangling us, you're going to burn out. You're going to grow weary. Worst case scenario, you're going to have a major fall that breaks things. Trust, your lives. <laughs> I'm not looking anyone in the eye right now. <laughs> the Christian life is not just getting the spirit on track for heaven. Right, right. It's being set free right, yeah. right here in this place. Right. We're not just leaving behind sinfulness, but we need to, we need to leave behind and cast off the hindrances. Shrug it off. Shake it off. In the great words of the theologian Taylor Swift. Shake it off. If you are feeling tired in your personal walk, if you are feeling tired with your walk with Jesus, and I get it, I'm the father of three daughters, I'm going to school, I'm working, and I volunteer at the church. I know what tired is. But I have the fullness of joy. <laughs> I know what it means to have a full schedule. What I'm talking about is being conscious of the hindering thoughts, stopping those patterns dead in their tracks and kicking them back out the door. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much is on your plate, how much responsibility God has entrusted to you in this season, whether you're Pastor Rag or if this is your first time joining us tonight, that is all our responsibility. So how do we do it? How do we run with perseverance? The very next words, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Yep. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. How do soulish people do that? Spiritual disciplines. Soulish people, that's us. The way that we fix our eyes on Jesus is the spiritual disciplines. First of four that I'm going to talk about tonight is study. These are ways that we can detangle sin and throw off the weight of the world. The soul work in each of our lives. The first one is study. You've got to get in the Word. Yes. Amen. That's right. This is what this looks like. It's designated time. It's setting aside time with minimal distractions and intentionally studying. Studying is not just reading. Reading is great. Studying involves a question. Yeah. Yes. What is the question? Here's some questions you can think of. What does the Bible say about discipline? Mm -hmm. You can study that for the rest of our 10 weeks. You will not exhaust it. What does the Bible say about sin? What does the Bible say about unbelief? Study involves you intentionally following the trail of a question. That's the simplest definition of it. Who was this Bible character? Where did they live? What else does the Bible tell us about that time period? If you like the history stuff, maybe get into more of the historical narratives. I would also challenge you to stick with the source. If all of your studying is looking at what other people have said about the Bible. Mm. And not just the Bible itself. Right. You are not studying the Bible. Right. Yeah, right. That's true. Right. Let's sing on tonight. Right. Study the Bible. I'm not saying what everyone else has said is wrong. I'm just saying they studied the Bible. Go right. study the Bible. Right. Our goal with studying the Bible is to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Yes. Right. What that means... That's, that's Bible-ese, but what that means is that we can apply God's Word in our life. Yeah. Mm 
Yeah. In the most difficult situations, remember, we are being called up to be a Daniel generation to rightly divide the word of God, to apply it in our lives, not just in our personal lives, but into the situations in our lives. The next one, we're on two of four, inward disciplines. Meditate. Meditate. I will warn you, society and its pace and its customs are a hindrance to meditation. Yeah. It's true. There's an Eastern thought that meditation is a complete emptying of yourself until you reach enlightenment. That is not at all what we're talking about. I don't want you empty. I want you full. <laughs> full. I want you looking at God's word. I want you to, to memorize scripture and get it chewing on your thoughts. Just start chewing on it. Right. Psalm 23. I love this story. Psalm 23. There's just a little chunk in there. And it says, you have prepared a table in the presence of my enemies. And you just take that little nugget and you just chew on it. You have prepared a table in the presence of my enemies. The personal story for me, and I am going to go a little long, but this is good. This is good, I promise. I was at work over at the school. I've been there 18 months. And my boss, who was the IT director at that time, just not a very agreeable guy. Okay, that's being generous. But for the sake of recording purposes and this being published, just not a very agreeable guy. And it had gotten to the point where there, I'm, I, I like to think of myself as an agreeable guy, if you know what I mean. So a little bit of a kind of a light hit in the dark there. Um, and it had gotten to the point where he was making threats upon my job based on things that had no grounds. Okay, just a tough spot. We were having our firstborn, or let's see, Adel it would have been Adeline. So our secondborn was, was just about to come to this world, and he was making threats on my job. So it was a very, very tense place for the 26-year-old young Josiah to be in that position where, where my job is on the line, my wife is looking at going down even less than hours, what on earth is going on? And I remember it was the weekend before Easter, and the following, after Easter break, we were going to have a meeting. <laughs> so we're coming up to Easter weekend, which is like go time for church. Like we should be on our, the top of it. Like this is the best. Like Easter's awesome. And I'm just in this low place. And all I had, I left the house at 2.30 a.m. on Friday night because I just had to go out for a drive. And the Lord, about 40 minutes in, gave me that little chunk of Psalm 23. And it was, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I grabbed that. And I meditated on that for days and days and days. And I distinctly remember before I went into the meeting, it was on a Wednesday, that following Wednesday, that I was going into a meeting with the superintendent, my boss, and me, and it was my future. And I remember looking in the mirror, and I said, <laughs> you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Um, God is good. I am the IT director at the school district. Yes. Glory to God. God is good. He preserves us even in the presence of our enemies. I had that to hold on to because I meditated on it. But God is good. God is gracious. And he gave that to me when I sought him. Seek the Lord. We gain an insight into his word and how it can impact our life and our situations. What are you meditating on? You got a brain and it's got signal. Otherwise, you wouldn't be looking at me. Okay? So what is your brain meditating on? Get it meditating on God's word. Fasting. Woo. Not my favorite discipline. I really enjoy food. Okay? I really do. <laughs> to the point where I, I make most of the dinners at my house because I just, I love cooking. I go grocery shopping. I just, anything that has the food part in it, I enjoy all of it. I take my girls grocery shopping with me. Just food. Woo. Um, not to the dismay of my wife or to bring her into, the, into this at all, but when we got married, she, she said the words, I wish we didn't have to eat. It's such a waste of time, which <laughs> it was a dagger into my soul. <laughs> but we've, we've gotten to a good place. She will eat whatever I make for supper, and then I get to make just delicious food. So it's a win-win. Um, I love food. And so all of that to say fasting is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah. She's like, I think I forgot to eat supper. I was like, what? How does one forget to eat a meal? But anyways, I do not have that problem. But what fasting is, in the most simplest understanding, is denying yourself of a worldly thing so that you can take up a spiritual thing. If you just deny but don't take up, you're just hungry. 
A lot of cultures in the world fast. There's even just good diets that involve fasting. That's not the point. We're not on a diet. Although the Lord also blesses us when we need that too. <laughs> fasting is both beneficial to health and spirit. But uh, what it does, it reminds us that we have this need for God. It's an utter need. There's, there's, there's only this need. There's not sufficiency outside of him. And it's so easy to look at other things and forget that. So it reminds us of our dependence on him. Yesterday I skipped lunch. And I like lunch. I like getting that boost of food. Um, but I found myself, between the course of the first half of this week, praying in tongues whenever I was by myself. Yeah, good. Which is not normal normal. Like, hmm. It should be. Yep. Yes, Don. It should be normal. <laughs> But I was quickened to it. I love that word. It's such a spirit word. I was quickened to it because I, I had denied myself. It gets my attention. Now, maybe for some people, if you just don't care about food, then the whole fasting thing will be really easy for you. But does it get your attention on God? You've got to kind of figure that out. I'll let you figure that out with Jesus. Prayer is our last one, and then we'll get on to actually doing these questions in prayer. Prayer is what makes this relationship with God personal. But we don't have to go through Pastor Ray to get a message to God. That's right. That's the model and the beauty of Christianity. Pastor Ray teaches us how to pray, but we don't have to go through you to get a message up. God can have a personal relationship with you. It's your communication with God. Sometimes it's asking. Sometimes it's seeking, which I call active asking. <laughs> or it's knocking. Where are you, God? Let me in. Other times we're crying. Sometimes we're laughing. Sometimes we're calm. Sometimes we're mad. It's personal. Learning to hear and not just to speak. That's right. And with that, awesome. learning to speak what you hear him saying. Amen. Especially when we're praying for other people. What I'm saying tonight is that we play an active role in our faith. Yeah. We do. Inactive faith is actually just unbelief. If your faith isn't active, you're building an unbelief system in your life. When we throw off hindrances, we do that by renewing our minds. We detangle sin and rob it of its power when we confess it. And we run with perseverance by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, just like Hebrews tells us. He marked out the way for us to go. Run ye in it. We're going to take this time now. We're going to transition into our table time. We have tables spread out, starting here and then going all the way out into all the hallways of the church, just like we did last week. Take the time at the table. I've got some questions there that go right along with what we talked about. Hindrances, sin, those four disciplines. Make sure you have time at the end for prayer, but I'm going to say a quick prayer with us right here. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for depositing these things into my heart, challenging me, Jesus. Lord, quickening my spirit to you, Lord, to be attentive to you. Lord, I pray for each soul here, Jesus. Get our attention. Lord Jesus, as a people gathered together to form a church here, Jesus, get our attention on you. There's going to be momentum when we all start running the same direction. So Jesus, I pray right now I cast off those hindrances. I bind them. I bind them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I empower each and every person here with the courage to pursue your righteousness and confess sin, Jesus. Lord, to live in freedom. I proclaim freedom. Jesus, in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are not done here tonight. God, you are about to do a great work in the hearts of each person here. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get skidootin'. Don't waste any time. Find a table. What's that? Skidootin'. That's Greek for you should really get moving. That's Norwegian. Ufta. Got to get skidootin' there, don't you know? Don't worry, that's on the recording. I haven't stopped it yet. That's just for you, Danielle.